It's hard not to think about radiation even when mentioning Chernobyl for a second. A lot of pop culture, like videos, movies, TV series, games, kind of demonizes the outcome of the event. Of course it was tragic and it shouldn't happen. We really owe a lot to the people who cleaned up the exclusion zone. So, for example, the liquidators. They made sure that the radiation level was lowered as much as it could be lowered. But overall, now it is not as dangerous there as it may seem. And this feeling that the whole exclusion zone is one of the most dangerous places on the whole planet is vastly exaggerated. Last time we talked about HBO miniseries and how was it not accurate in 100%. You can save the link from the upper right corner just to look it up later. But in some ways it does create unnecessary fear when it comes down to nuclear energy. Well, at least I feel that way. One of the main examples of this is that the HBO show the radiation like some kind of a spreadable virus, which is of course not true. In the past, this was often a fear that left people stigmatized, like the ones that survived Hiroshima or were working in Chernobyl. I hope that none of you thought of nuclear power as a true antagonist of the HBO miniseries, because not the radiation was the problem, but the people. But we will leave this for another episode. We will speak about the truths and the false ideas and the fear about nuclear energy in the following months. For now, let's just explore the whole subject. How high the radiation levels were and how high are they now? In this part of this episode, we will talk mostly about the first days and weeks after the explosion at Chernobyl nuclear power plant, as there is this true sensationalism built in. We'll shortly tell you exemplary measurements from a few years ago to show you that there is little to be afraid of now. So radiation doses in general, what are the safe levels? It's really troublesome to exactly tell what will happen to a particular human exposed to a particular dose of radiation. It is exactly the same as with, for example, an injury. Some people will heal faster, others will heal slower, some organisms will just react better. However, there are estimations and precautions that everyone should take when encountering some sort of radiation source. The doses are usually given as sieverts, or more often millisieverts, so the one thousandth of the sievert. It is written accordingly as SV and MSV. If 100 people would take individual doses of 5 sieverts, around half of them would die. If the dose was 10 sieverts, most, if not all of them, would be dead within weeks. When we think about the liquidators, usually the ones who took a dose of 6 sieverts died within a month. But what about the regular radiation? It may be a shock to you, but 80% of a standard annual dose, so around 2.4 to maybe 3 millisieverts, is created by purely natural sources. Only 20% come from human-made sources, like medical equipment, CT scans for example. It can also vary from country to country. In England, the estimated typical safe annual dose is around 2 millisieverts, while in Finland it's 7 millisieverts. Remember the classic quote from HBO's Chernobyl, where Legasov tells Sturbina that... Yes, 3.6 Rontgen, which by the way is not the equivalent of one chest x-ray, but rather 400 chest x-ray. The regular x-ray is just 0.1 millisievert. The usual CT scan is 15 to 16 millisieverts, while the radiation at Fukushima was 1.02 millisieverts per hour. Now let's see what this means. There are some guidelines on how much radiation can we take without having any impact on our body. Usually most scientists agree that the dose of 100 millisieverts is a lower minimum annual dose, which has some impact on the cancer risk. The guideline states that it's a dose at which any increase is clearly evident. This means that the dose of 100 millisieverts is proven to increase the cancer risk, but there is no indication of how much it increases the mentioned risk. The short word any is the important one in that sentence. Even the 0.000001% bigger risk means that it has increased. This doesn't mean that after receiving 100 millisieverts yearly dose, you will definitely get cancer it's possible you won't even notice it. And your doctor too. You can get 9% of this dose, so 9 millisieverts, 
just by flying from New York to Tokyo by the polar route. And yes, radiation is that common, it's all around us. But then again, it's all about the timing, the particular person, and for example, the source of the radiation. So how high were the radiation levels on the day that disaster happened? So shortly after it. We should definitely divide those by place and time. Of course, the highest levels were and still are in the closest vicinity of the reactor core number 4. It's estimated that in the reactor building, at the time of explosion, was 300 sieverts, or 300,000 millisieverts per hour. This means that if you were standing there for only one minute, you would have a 50% chance of this being a fatal dose. This would be 5 sieverts. The true horror of this was that the reactor staff didn't have access to any high-range dosimeter. They were buried in the remains of the building. The other ones were capable of a lower maximum range. This fact left the staff suspicious about the readings, but they couldn't be sure. So they were still trying what they could to aid the situation, but in the same time they were getting a huge doses of radiation. Other places near the reactor hall, however not so irradiated, were really dangerous too. For example, the radiation levels of the debris scattered around the explosion were from 50 to 150 sieverts per hour. So 50,000 to 150,000 millisieverts per each hour. This means that if you stood there for 2 to 5 minutes, you would probably be dead in a few weeks. The closest area of the destructed building was about 10 to 15 sieverts per hour, so 10 to 15,000 millisieverts. Staying there for more than 30 minutes would mean the 50-50% chances of survival dose. The interesting fact is that the control room suffered from fairly small radiation, at least compared to other sections of the building. It was about 0.03 to 0.05 sieverts per hour, so 30 to 50 millisieverts. The explosion itself released around 100 radioactive elements into the atmosphere. Fortunately, most of them reduced the radioactivity fairly quickly. But there were some more radioactive and more dangerous elements, with, if I may call it, longer lifespan. And what the territory itself? How big area was endangered? The exclusion zone, which is the restricted area around Chernobyl nuclear power plant, has around 30 km radius. The winds and storms carried radioactive particles a lot farther. It is estimated that about 150 square kilometers were contaminated initially, with the spread of even 500 kilometers north of the power plant. So guys, how would you like to hear more about the radiation? Not only in Chernobyl, but maybe even in general. If you have some suggestions, please leave a comment. Also, do the same if you are interested in something related to Chernobyl, which we didn't speak about yet. This was the first part of this episode, so the subject of radioactivity. So be sure that you will keep an eye on the new ones. Next week's episode is a surprise, so let's stay in touch. Last week we wished you a Merry Christmas, this time we wish you everything the best for the new year. Hope you will stay safe and see you next week guys.